Good morning. We have a treat. Instead of chimes today, we'll have a musical intro to begin our service. Please silence your cell phones. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning. I welcome you to worship this morning here at Pilgrim Church. My name is Amy Jaguer, and you're still sort of (laughs) newish. At least I feel that way. Minister here at the church, and we are an open and affirming congregation of the United Church of Christ. And what that means to us is that no matter who you are, or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. So we're glad that you have chosen to be with us this morning to worship God. And if you are visiting with us for the first time, whether here in the sanctuary or joining us on the live stream, we'd like to offer an especially warm welcome to you and hope that you will come back and worship with us often. I do have a few announcements for you this morning. I'd like to make sure that you know that everyone is invited for a time of fellowship down the hall, through the store and down the hall, to Mamblo Hall for a coffee hour. We're looking forward to seeing you there. I'd also like to say, you just heard the beautiful music already from our guest musicians today, Kyle Spraker on trumpet and Maria Rendinello Spraker on the harp. I hope I pronounced your names correctly. (laughs) So let's give them a warm welcome. And so we will begin our worship as we listen to the morning prelude. Thank you. 
So I'd like to invite us now to sing as we'll do each Sunday during Lent this beautiful song, Seek Ye First. Please join me in the call to worship. I will read the one, and you will read the all. What is it like to begin again? It is like flowers in the spring that push through frozen ground. It is like babies learning to walk, one clumsy step at a time. It is like Nicodemus in the night asking Jesus for guidance. It is like a Sunday morning, starting our week anew. May we find God in our seeking. May we learn as we go. May we be brave enough to begin again. Let us worship the God of new beginnings. As you know, we've been lighting a peace candle for over a year now since the crisis in Ukraine, but it's for peace for the whole entire world and our nation. Please join me in singing, and it's not love diving, it's love divine, all loves excelling, (laughs) page 43.
please join me in the opening prayer. Holy God, we come to you today with our biggest questions. Who are we called to be? What do you need from us? Where are you in our midst? How can we follow you more clearly? As we worship today, we ask that you would weave answers into our prayers, the music, the text, and our receiving of communion. Speak to us through these elements of worship that we might find what we are seeking in you in this time and in this place. With gratitude and open hearts, we pray. Amen. One of the things I love about the prayer of confession is it offers us a new beginning. In the prayer of confession, we lay our cards on the table. We speak honestly with God about who we are and who we long to be. God wraps us in grace and lets us begin again. So together with God's grace, let us wipe the slate clean. Together with God's grace, let us pray the prayer of confession. God of new life, you call us into unknown places, and we bury our heads in the sand. You promise all the stars in the sky, and we doubt it can be true. You speak of new life in the spirit, and we tell ourselves we've missed our chance. Over and over and over again, you invite us closer to you. Show us the way. Forgive our mistakes. Give us the courage to begin again with you. Amen. Family of faith, hear and believe this good news. There is a grace to God's love that is bigger than we can imagine. No matter what we did or didn't do yesterday, we have been forgiven. Today the slate is wiped clean. Today we are made new. Join me in saying, we all belong to God. We are held in God's love. We are made new. Amen. Please acknowledge one another with a wave or a nod, or my favorite, a peace sign. Peace be with you.
Today's first reading is from Genesis 12, verses 1 through 4. And you'll find it on page 10 in the Old Testament in your pew Bibles if you want to follow along. The Lord had said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram went, as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. I'm not sure what to do about that. Can we make an adjustment? We'll forge ahead, and hopefully, if it starts up again, then I'll turn it off and we'll pause. Okay. This morning's gospel reading is from John chapter 3, the first 17 chapters. Now, there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with that person. Jesus answered him, Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from, Or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you the teacher of Israel and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. May God's blessing be added to the hearing and understanding of this holy word. Please pray with me. O gracious God, may the words of my lips and the meditations of all of our hearts be not only acceptable, but pleasing in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So I'd like to begin this morning by looking at our bulletin cover. 
Hopefully you didn't put it away too far out of reach. So this image is a rendering of Nicodemus, whose conversation with Jesus was just highlighted in our gospel reading from John. The artist described Nicodemus as being metaphorically disrobed, aging, and vulnerable. As you can see, he is surrounded by milky gray swirls that the artist describes as spirit and water and wonders, how can this be? Haven't I reached my benchmarks? How is it that you, God, are calling me to begin again? The artist whose name, as you can see underneath the the image here, is Carmel Boigling. She was raised in a Spanish-speaking Pentecostal church in Miami called Renacimiento, which is also the title of the painting. A simple translation of this word, Renacimiento, to English means rebirth or renaissance. In her artist's statement, Carmel writes that for her small Pentecostal church, renacimiento means far more than the symbolism of being born-again Christians. It is a perpetual reminder that each time we gather to encounter Jesus, the Spirit calls us to continuous transformation, calling dead things into new life and the Holy Spirit filled revival. I love this piece and how the artist portrays the gospel lesson for today and how she describes Nicodemus visiting Jesus at night. So who is this Nicodemus? Well, we know that he was a Pharisee, and Pharisees were set apart to study and interpret the law of Moses. They tried hard to obey it, It seems that they gave a lot of time and attention to rituals, to ceremonies, to behaviors, to live out God's will for their lives. Therefore, Nicodemus, who I'm affectionately calling Nick, as I feel like I've gotten to know him this week, his life was likely focused on following the rules and adhering to the letter of the law. It certainly seems significant that Nick visited Jesus at night, He was a respected teacher of Israel and served as a member of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish council. He wielded significant religious, social, and political power, all of which likely would have kept him very busy during the day. But more importantly, though, a meeting in public with Jesus could have jeopardized his position and his reputation. His entire identity was built on his authority as a teacher and a scholar, as well as his reputation as a good man and and devout follower of the Lord. But still, he was curious. Stepping into the light would challenge Nicodemus' self-image and worldview. So he goes to Jesus under the veil of night to ask him big questions faith questions. I can't enunciate too much. In their conversation, Jesus spoke about being born from above, which Nick found very difficult to understand, as you just heard in their interchange. He takes Jesus' words literally and asks, how can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter back into the mother's womb and be born? It seems it is very difficult for him to understand the concept of new life in water and the spirit that Jesus describes. And as Carmel experiences worship in her Miami church. So Nicodemus asks Jesus again, how can this be? Perhaps he is stuck in his more literal perspective of rule following. Does this resonate with you at all? Well, being a recovering rule follower myself, it certainly resonates with me. 
It is our human nature to kind of get stuck sometimes. We naturally resist change. Even science has something to say about this with Sir Isaac Newton's law of inertia. Do you remember this? This tendency to resist changes in a state of motion is inertia. The larger the mass, the greater the resistance. The longer we hold on to our beliefs, as in Nicodemus's case, the more resistant to change we become. Jesus emphasizes that he is speaking of heavenly things, not earthly things, and the difference between flesh and spirit. He describes the movement of the wind blowing where it chooses, and though we hear the sound of it, we do not know where it comes from or where it is going, which is true of life in the spirit for those of us who try to live there. This is anything but static inertia. I believe it is Jesus encouraging Nick and us by extension to seek a new perspective, a cha- to change his worldview, to open himself up to transformation. And I wonder, isn't that what it means for us as resurrection people? Do we not believe at our core that new life and second and more chances, growth and transformation are not only possible, but necessary to live a life of faith? Are we not meant, we are not meant to be stuck in a state of inertia. We continue to yearn for learning, for growth, for new life, and even a yearning and a willingness to step into the promise of what might be. So there are two narratives that we are following today. The one we've been reflecting on about being born again and starting anew, as well as the promise of a new expansive future, as was the case for Abram and Sarai, who would later be called by new names, Abraham and Sarah, to represent the new life they were embracing. Those two were called by God to leave everything they had and begin again. We now know that through that new beginning, God created a new family, a new nation. Their stepping out in faith led to all three Abrahamic traditions, Judaism, Islam, and Christianity. Abram and Sarai demonstrated the faith to answer God's call. Their journey was not perfect. Their trust had its limits. But throughout, they continued to move forward into the new life that God offered. They were called to go somewhere new, to be blessed by God and be a blessing To others. And so here we are, you as a congregation and me as your new minister, both having answered God's call to move forward in our new life together. And so I wonder what questions might we ask when we feel still in the dark about this what this will look like? How will we follow God's calling to begin again? In her book, The Great Emergence, author and religion professor Phyllis Tickle used an analogy of the 500-year rummage sale to describe religious change over the years. Tickle said that historically, by the way, don't you love her name? It's really cute. Um, She said that historically the church cleans house roughly every 500 years, holding on to what she called, or holding to what she calls the giant rummage sale of the church, deciding what to dispose of and what to keep. You've probably done this in your own lives, sorting through your own belongings. We need to sometimes make room for new things. Sometimes we need to ask what needs to die in our life in order to bring new life. As you may have read in a couple of places, I am very much aware that we are in this period of time now. In fact, We were already heading there before the pandemic, and the pandemic just 
pushed us a lot farther down the road really fast. So with all of this in mind, I believe that we have an invitation just as Jesus gave to Nicodemus, and a call just as God gave to Abram and Sarai to begin again, to change our perspective and our frame of reference. And when we do this, we can begin to see new solutions, to come up with new ideas for the future of our church and the community that it's in. Who is God calling us to be, and what is God calling us to do? I think a place that we can begin is by getting really clear about our why. Why do we exist as an institution? What is our unique contribution to the world? What difference do we make? How might we respond to the realities of our present circumstances? How are we seeking God in this time, in this place? And how are we helping others to do the same? Over the weeks and months to come, I hope that we can let these be our guiding questions. Bruce, my husband, and I decided last night to go to the movies. We looked online to see what was playing and learned of a new movie by the name of Jesus Revolution. Have you heard of it? I hadn't until yesterday afternoon. It's based on a true story highlighted as the cover story of Time magazine on June 21st, 1971. Does anybody remember this? That was a long time ago, but I was compelled by the way that a small dying church in Southern California began again by opening itself up to young people seeking God. They were called hippies. <laughs> it didn't look the same, the church didn't look the same as it always had. In fact, the pastor was initially in the dark about these so called hippies, but his eyes were opened. So he opened the doors of his church as well. Some church members objected, saying they were coming in with dirty, bare feet and would mess up the shag carpeting. Remember? Remember that? The following Sunday, in humility, the pastor responded by sitting at the doorway of the entry into the church, washing the feet of all who entered. He did it because he believed that all who are earnestly seeking God ought to be able to find God in the church. What a radical idea, right? So, we come back to Nicodemus. What happened to him? Does anybody remember? Well, his dark night, ultimately, we wonder. I Actually, I wondered this as I was spending more time thinking about him this week, did his dark night actually deepen his understanding of who God was in his seeking? Did his perspective change? Well, it's important to note that Nicodemus shows up later in two places in John's gospel. First, when he challenges his fellow Pharisees to refrain from judging Jesus' teaching without first listening to and learning from him, just like that Southern California pastor did about those hippies. And again, when he works with Joseph of Arimathea to care for Jesus' body after his crucifixion, it was Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus who cared for his body after Jesus died. So at the beginning of John's Gospel, we encounter Nicodemus in the darkness of night. And by the end of the gospel, we find him walking in the light, carrying the blessed body of Jesus and placing him in the tomb of resurrection. So hopefully, we can appreciate Nick's faith journey. We don't know if he found clarity in the moment we read about today, but we do know that he continued his faith journey and showed up for Jesus, to defend him and to care for him. So may we, like Nick, continually be born from above 
as the Spirit calls us to continuous growth and transformation, to begin again as a community and as individuals. And so I'd like to conclude by reading this poem by John O'Donohue, and its title is For a New Beginning. In out-of-the-way places of the heart, where your thoughts never think to wander, this beginning has been quietly forming, waiting until you were ready to emerge. For a long time, it has watched your desire, feeling the emptiness grow inside you, noticing how you willed yourself on, still unable to leave what you had outgrown. It watched you play with the seduction of safety and the gray promises that sameness whispered. Heard the waves of turmoil rise and relent. Wondered, would you always live like this? Then, in delight, when your courage kindled and you stepped out onto new ground, your eyes young again with energy and dream, a path of plenitude opening before you. Though your destination is not yet clear, you can trust the promise of this opening. Unfurl yourself into the grace of beginning. That it at one with that it is at one with your life's desire. Awaken your spirit to adventure. Hold nothing back. Learn to find ease in risk. And soon you'll be home in a new rhythm. For your soul senses that the world awaits you. May it be so. And now let us join together in singing our next hymn. Page 531. Lord, speak to me that I may speak. So I invite us now, as we each week of Lent read a different affirmation of faith, I invite us to read this one together. And again, as we did last week, hold on to the things that resonate with you as you start to 
seek or as we are seeking what we believe about God. So we believe in a God who meets us in the shadows, who welcomes our questions, who invites us to begin again. We believe that Jesus showed us a new way, a deeper faith, a more compassionate existence. We believe that all of our beginnings should return us to this foundation and that no matter how many times we lose our way, God always welcomes us home. Amen. Many lay readers come up here and talk about different ways to give to the church, such as time, talent, and treasure. But I bet you didn't even know that in your house you have gold. And that's the term that was used in the after-school program when we referred to cardboard. So do you know what these are? Yep, they are. <laughs> But in the after-school program, they're horns, or they're bolts and a robot. Or if you string them all together, it's a run for marbles. I heard that last time they put several of these together with lots of masking tape and started up here and had marbles going all the way around. And if it didn't work, they'd have to do it again. Deb and Becky also talk about the after-school program. Sometimes they'll give them a challenge, and they'll give them a whole bunch of cardboard. They use paper towel rolls. They use the, the cardboard rolls that are inside wrapping paper. Here's a sleeve from a to-go coffee cup. And the ever-popular egg carton. These are all gold to the kids in the after-school program. So I suggested to Deb and Becky to put a box out under the coat rack, and it says after-school collections. So instead of recycling these at your transfer station or putting them out for the trash pickup, bring them in and put them in that box, and the kids would really appreciate it. The morning offering will now be taken.
Let us pray as we dedicate these offerings. O gracious God, we dedicate to you not only these gifts, but also ourselves in deep gratitude for your call on our lives to begin again. Your blessing for us as well, so we may be a blessing for others. Accept what we bring for your own good purposes. In Christ we pray. Amen. So I invite us now into a time of prayer. This will be on the briefer side since we still have a communion to, to partake together. So let us be in a spirit of prayer. O oh, gracious God, we are so aware of our need for you and how we seek you so diligently. We especially do so when we are in need something for ourselves or something for someone that we love or care about. And so we have these requests from the congregation, O God, and ask that you be with each of the people who are being prayed for, as well as those who are asking for the prayers. And so today, may we pray for Kathleen, Sally, Dee Dee, and Jay, all fighting cancer for Beth recovering from hip surgery, for Alex, Wendy, Suzanne, Gail, and Vinny, also all fighting cancer, and Connie, who broke her hip, for Bobby in hospital, for Joanna as she makes decisions regarding her cancer treatment, for the family of Christopher, who died last weekend, for Ted's father, for Bob and Louise, and Dave, John, Tim, Bud and Midge, and Jean, recovering from COVID and pneumonia. And also, O oh God, a prayer of thanksgiving for baby Mick making progress after 110 days in the hospital. Praise be to you, O oh God. And now we offer to you, in this time of silence, our prayers which are perhaps too fragile for the spoken word. Holy One, we ask these and all things in the name of Jesus Christ who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we come to the table, I want to just share a little bit of logistical information with you. So we will be partaking of communion by intinction this morning, which means when it's time to receive the elements, you will be um, directed by one of the ushers to 
circle around and come up the middle, receive your elements, and then um, go back to your seat in that kind of a pattern. All of the bread is gluten-free, and uh, we serve grape juice instead of wine. So just wanting everybody to know those details. And so the first part of our communion service, uh, you can follow along in your bulletin. So Luke the Evangelist wrote of our risen Savior, who at table with two of the disciples took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Their eyes were opened, and they recognized the risen Christ in the breaking of the bread. In company with all believers in every time and beyond time, we come to this table to know the risen Christ in the breaking of the bread. Brothers and sisters in Christ, the first time Jesus sat down to this meal, among those who gathered were one who would doubt him, one who would deny him, and one who would betray him. And they would all leave him alone before the night was over, and he knew it. And still, he sat down to eat with them. And if he sat down to eat with them, surely he is willing to eat with us, baptized or not, confessed or not, Christian or not, sure or not, believer or not, saint or sinner or a little bit of both. All you have to be to eat at this table is hungry, and God will do the rest. Let us pray. Holy One, we give you thanks and praise this morning. You provide for us in our need. You set a table before us in the wilderness of our seeking. Even when we despair and complain, you feed us with bread from heaven. Even when we question your grace, you give us water from a stone. How can we keep silent? Even dry bones in the valley of death stand to sing your praise. And as we seek to begin again, we trust that you are always with us, inviting us to transformation, to rebirth, to a changed perspective. We trust and follow you in all our ways, even when we see in the glass only dimly. Now we ask, O oh God, that you pour out your Holy Spirit upon this bread and this cup. By the power of your Spirit, breathe life into the dust and hope of, into our bones. As we receive this bread and cup, make us one flesh and one blood, one in the body of Christ. Let us live and sing your praise and show your love to all through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And so we remember on the night of betrayal and the eve of his death, Jesus took bread and broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, this is the, my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And I just realized this is where the bread is. In the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup and he poured it out for his disciples, saying, this is the new covenant in my blood given for you. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, come, for all things have been made ready as we participate in this gift that Christ has given us through the bread and through the cup. Come, people of God, for all things have been made ready.
the prayer of thanksgiving. We give thanks, almighty God, that you have refreshed us at your table by granting us the presence of your Son, Jesus Christ. Strengthen our faith, increase our love for one another, and send us forth in courage and peace, choosing in the power of the Holy Spirit through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. We will now sing closing hymn number 473. Blessed Assurance. And now as we go forth into our week ahead, starting anew, I want to offer this benediction that you may either join with me in saying or just receive as the Spirit leads you. As we leave this place, may God bless us with seeking. May we seek out the hungry, seek the weary, seek the good in every person we pass, seek out the hopeful, Seek the faithful, seek God in ourselves. As we seek and as we wonder, may we find what we are looking for in the name of our loving God, who is always seeking us. Go now in peace. Amen.